Craig, good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you for having me on your show today. It's our first chance to speak with you since Election Day. Your reaction to those results, Craig, that saw you defeated? Uh, to, to, look, I don't know whether I've got a reaction to it or not. I'm not. I'm disappointed. Maybe embarrassed is a better word for it. Uh, but other than that, hey, look, it's public service. Uh, I've lost before. I'm well aware of that. Uh, and it, it's okay. There's other things to do in life uh, to start with. Uh, and, you know, I was back here in Charleston on Wednesday because we were coming into a special session. Uh, so it was back to work, so to speak. Uh, I'll tell you a little story, though, of things weren't going all that well and getting things rubbed out in the special session. And at 9 o'clock on Thursday morning, I texted my counsel, who was sitting next to me. I said, you glad for me to be back? She shook her head, yes, uh, because in about a half an hour, we had an agreement of to be able to get things managed. And to a greater degree, we've done that of in the special session here. We've still got two or three bills of uh, that need to be addressed that are bound up in the House of Delegates. They have not uh, fared very well over there. Uh, but that's you can ask questions now, and I'll answer them. Very good. I, I will do that because I, I do want to get to the special session items, especially because we need to uh, finalize the budget in a more detailed manner. But uh, to stay on election night, have you done any self-analysis as to why you think you were defeated? Well, there's a couple reasons for that. Uh, one of them is is this the Stand for Us group, and that's an outside, out-of-state pack, of, and they're made up of a bunch of D.C. people that looks like they dumped in over $600,000. And what they did, it was on a Senate bill, I think the number was 325, uh, pharmaceuticals, and the, uh, it was the PBM pharmacy benefit managers. And what it did was is that, well, first of all, they claimed that we were giving free health care to illeg illegal immigrants, which is not even remotely true. It's categorically false. And it was passed out of the Senate with a vote, I believe, of 33 uh, to, with one absent. Uh, and then on the House side, it was 96 uh, to one no vote and three absent. I think I got the numbers right on the, the Senate one. I've forgotten about that one lately. But what I'm getting at is it was a unanimous vote. It had nothing to do with that. It was about keeping of uh, the the, the, the money in the pockets of the people of West Virginia. Uh, it had nothing to do with illegal immigrants getting health care. And so they come in and push this false narrative. And there was a lot of false narratives that was out there. Uh, and I, I don't feel like getting any of them because it sounds like I'm crying over spilt milk or whatever it may be. And I'm not. Uh, but I don't see how we're ever going to get good people to run for public office when they went through uh, what I just went through. And I ran a positive campaign, uh, but and I know negative sells, that if you do negative campaigning, uh, that it, it has a positive effect uh, from that standpoint. But uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I would rather lose, do the right thing, keep the integrity that I know that I have and the work that I've done. And you can actually see that in the special session down here where my caucus is, um, let me back up and say our caucus is f frustrated. Uh, they're frustrated uh, because they don't know who's going to be the next leader. They, they want, you know, uh, the, the vast majority of them would like for me to still be here leading them because I get the information in front of them. I help them make the right decisions. We make the right decisions on the floor. And you can see that by the votes that we've had here in the last couple of days. It takes four fifths to be able to suspend the rules, to pass the bills out, to move them through the process quickly. And every one, almost every one of the bills had 31 to zero with three absent. And that's a, that's a, uh, 
it's a way of having an insight into the members know, even if they don't like me or whatever, that they're saying, hey, let's get ready and, and, and do the work of the state, do the work of the people. And, and, and we do. Uh, so I'm more of an organizer or I call it a wedding planner. Uh, making it so that everybody's got the right information so that they can actually make good decisions. And I've done, let me add one more thing. I think that that's probably what has happened in this election cycle as well. If you don't have honest information in front of you, how can you make good decisions? Uh, but, again, I'm going to make more money. That that was one of the issues that they were beat me up on. I will make more m money retired and going back to work for my business than I ever made doing this job. So this was never about the money. This was about fixing West Virginia, getting the tax relief, getting our education system right, getting our roads uh, taken care of and the infrastructures. Uh, all those things uh, come into play on that. And to be quite honest with you, I was pretty good at it. And so be it. And that was even before I was ever Senate president. Bill Cole valued of my of insights and, and historical knowledge, what took place and what didn't work, and uh, Mitch Carmichael did as well. And uh, I know everybody gets tired of hearing about flatline budget, but we're in a position right now in this state because of how we went about creating the, uh, our budget and not spending up to our revenue estimates, but spending to what we needed to spend to, and then putting the other resources back either into tax relief, capital improvements, or savings. And we did a combination of all three. I've said that on your show before. I'm proud of it. Proud of the success that we've had over the last 20 years. Now, if you want me to add one more thing, here's what my greatest fear is. Sure. And that is is that the world has turned into social issue after social issue after social issue. We've addressed virtually every social issue that you need to address up to the point where it becomes absurd going any further. And But you have these organizations out here that feed off this and make money off of it by wanting to keep th their organization alive over whatever – social issue that is out there because but we've addressed them in the state of West Virginia and I'll have to be honest I didn't predict that we would run into that wall but whenever you're talking about you know the the chemical castration that was out there what the, what you didn't hear was is that we made it so you couldn't get surgical transitions for minors in the state of West Virginia which wasn't happening happening to begin with and then you couldn't give the, 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 any amount of medication or chemical to allow for transition either. But yet it was spun in a way that the voters did not know that. Matt Miller. So. Yeah, Craig, I just had a, a quick question, um, not to belabor what we've been talking about as far as the, the election results, but when Rob asked you, your first two words you said you were, you were disappointed, and the second one was embarrassed, and that one kind of caught me by surprise. Was that just maybe a reflection on how you campaigned, and maybe you look back and go, I could have done a few things differently? Ha uh -uh. No, the embarrassed part is em embarrassed uh, for the, my members down here and the work I do. I know I have a tremendous amount of support uh, in the West Virginia Senate and throughout this state for the work that we've done. And many, many people know of the, when you're down in Charleston, of so many people know what you do of when you're in the eastern panhandle it's a little harder to know that especially i don't spend a lot of time pounding my chest one of the things that we don't do well is when we solve problems and make things better we don't take victory laps and saying this is what we did we go out and look for the next thing to work on of and that that's of i'm a fixer we're, in the West Virginia Senate, to a greater degree, we're wanting to fix problems. We want to be able to bring the economic development to the state that will lift the tax base up to be able to do all the other things that we need to do. I had a company in of yesterday morning 
before we went into the session that is looking to locate in in West Virginia of a steel plant and hiring over 250 people. That's a big deal. These these are jobs in West Virginia, and, and they fit with the, that area. Uh, they have a long history of of manufacturing steel, and so all that economic development. Uh, but I just feel like I've let the people down because I didn't. Apparently, I didn't let the voters know well enough, and I've certainly left my members down because they're clearly frustrated <laughs> that I'm not going to be here in january jonathan bodwell hey craig um let me uh let me ask a question how do you think not having you in the legislature as the west virginia senate president the lieutenant governor how do you think that will adversely affect the eastern panhandle and the strides we have made as far as you know getting getting a good portion of our money back from uh back from charleston when we send so much down there it'll have a big impact uh it was sort of funny on the campaign trail that everybody acted like they weren't campaigning for senate but they were campaigning for senate president and that's not the way this worked and and as the senate president look i, I got resources into the eastern pay handle i didn't pound my chest about it uh but the resources came in to be able to help uh make it so that we could manage our growth now i also got resources elsewhere into the state to be able to create growth of uh, and so it wasn't about as senate president you got to look out for everybody and uh when you um i'd have senators call me up and say craig i need help with this or that and of course i knew all the actors and there is as being senate president it can be a powerful position and over the four years i had done that and then what was it two and a half years as finance chairman Everybody knew me. They knew my style. They knew that I would not come and ask for something that was a bad idea. And even if it was a mediocre and I wasn't quite sure, I'd get a room full of people together and we'd sit down and talk about it and make the right decision. That's one of the things I did uh, down here is the Senate President's Conference Room. Uh, I had to make it larger so that we could caucus in there. What I didn't expect or didn't know was that that was going to be a meeting room to where you could actually bring together of whoever it was, the the groups, whether it's industry, whether it's legislators, of to agencies, whatever, and instead of everybody talking past each other, they would talk to each other, and then when you left the room, you had a strategy forward on for success. I watched it work day in day out down there and that was one of the things i was good at it's back to that wedding planner thing that i was talking about I hate to call myself a wedding planner but that's <laughs> i like that craig hey you need a job hey, hey, everybody needs a job craig let me let it's, me ask this it's the, stressful sometimes but it works as you're as you're heading into this special session or in the special session the waiver program um where I, idd waivers the idd about? waiver where are you guys on that, and do you think we're going to be able to get that get that over the hump so that you know the the people the the people with special needs in West Virginia are still taken care of the way they have been? Okay, first of all, there's no problem if we didn't do anything at all, but that's not where we want to be. Of uh, we negotiated out an agreement that where we'd fully fund of uh, everything, the IDD waiver was cut eleven million dollars. But just so everybody understands, it's listening. Even last year, it was fully funded. And they only spent like 67, 70 percent of the money, and then they transferred the rest of it out of IDD waiver somewhere else in the agency. And so the money never got to what we were appropriated out. So in that conference room that I was just talking about, I said, look, I'm interested in two things, transparency and accountability. Let's get ready, fully fund, put the money in a separate fund so that the secretary could actually come in, don't take an act of the legislature, but the secretary can sign off and move the funds over if they would need them. And so we did that. 
And it was a tune of $183 million that we were going to park in this fund uh, and so that they would be able to utilize it. And you could draw down federal dollars if you needed to, but it would make it so that everything would be funded where it's at. We passed that out of the uh, Senate, 31 to nothing with three ads. And right now, the House of Delegates, it's a train wreck. Of, and we're more than likely going to adjourn sine die today at noon. And But now for the people that are listening that's got to do deal with IDD waiver, there is no problems with the funding for any of this all the way into January, February, March. Zero. We're talking about optics more than anything when it comes to this. And we also uh, put, I think it was $6.6 million into it so that they could uh, in home uh, care where they're um, where to get paid. We were, the reimbursement was that, for that was being increased uh, also. And so, and they already had the flexibility to do that. The House of Delegates apparently want to make it so that they have to come back every year and manage this. That is not in a function of the legislature. That is a function of the executive and the agencies. So let me roll back to when I'm sitting there talking about the, their functions. What we need to do is be able to have the transparency to see what they're doing, and that's why we put the money into the fund uh, or wanted to put the money into the fund so that they'd have the transferability, but we'd have the transparency to be able to see what's going on, and that transparency would have made it so they would not have been transferring $100 million here or $20 million there that the, that the legislature had no idea, and the people pr would probably be offended by what they were doing. So th this was a long-term solution for a, a problem, and I'm very proud of it because that t t hey, I'm, I'm not up for, a, uh, for election now. Uh, I'm the one that put this together, uh, along with Brian Abraham and the Speaker. Uh, but the members of the House of Delegates can't seem to understand what's going on for whatever reason. Of uh, and they're, they're, I'll just leave it at that. Matt, did you have a question? Did I answer your question, <laughs> Craig? You did, man. Thank you. I I <laughs> okay. appreciate. And let me just say one thing quickly. I don't think you've taken enough victory laps through your career because you've really pushed a lot of stuff through. That's that's helped the whole state. But the, the, I, I agree with you on that, but my parents have raised me better than that. Uh, and again, there's still a lot more to do. do. Uh, and look, we've got to be able to get locality pay was the issue on the campaign. I've wanted to do locality pay since 2003. And it's just, and I thought when the Republicans took over, but no, everybody votes regionally. And so if you have more have nots than what you have haves, that doesn't work. You can't get people to vote for it. So they want everybody to be paid the same until you get an area that is, um, so that's the point of lifting up the Cabell Mason area. That's the point of lifting up North Central. That's the point of lifting up the, the Northern Panhandle. When you do all those things and you make it so that they're successful, then they're not such a drain on the tax base. And that allows you to be able to help the growing areas and then also to refocus on the areas that are not growing and help them along also. So you don't want to leave anybody behind, but you don't want to be so far out in front either that you have animosity. And I'll have to tell you, until I've demonstrated the Eastern Panhandle doesn't think it's special, that we don't think that uh, because the rest of West Virginia thinks we're rich, and they want our problems, and they think that they were elitist. And I've taken that away of by the, the leadership style, by working for everybody. I hope that that doesn't go away, uh, but I don't know that. 
uh, again, that's back to I'm afraid that everything is going to be social issues rather than solving the problems of the state that are, are really important because we've taken care of the social issue ones. It's as simple as that. Craig, as far as this special session, and knowing it was coming and, and the reason that it was called and so forth with the budget and wondering what the federal government might be doing and, and taking back money and so forth, is this kind of an easy lift special session, if you will? Is everybody on board? This should have been an easy lift special session uh, until you got to the um, the – the two bills that they're still sitting on over there have to forgive me. I've got to look at my paperwork to be able to – I've got a little bit of it spread out across my desk here. Uh, we we got virtually everything done, uh, but the one that contains the, uh, the fund that I was talking about for the, the Department of Human Services and the Department of Health so that they have money transferred around, that one is jammed up uh, over there and uh, – I don't know what's going to happen with that. I, I'm assuming that it's going to die right now uh, because the House delegates can't seem to get it together uh, on that aspect. So, so you had passed a skinny uh, budget to get through the legislative session. Now, does this push off the finishing touches of this budget until June now? Uh, to, if, to, what it is is that we did some of the things that we needed to do. We stopped the transfer to the rainy day fund because if we would have done a transfer to the rainy day fund, it was just money that was going to get parked over there and wouldn't be able to be utilized uh, to, to be able to help grow the state of West Virginia. We've got $1.26 billion in our rainy day fund. That comes out to being, I believe, about 21 to 22 percent, and that is more than amply funded. And then we got another f almost $500 million now now in a personal income tax reserve fund. Uh, and so we've got the resources that we need to do. We needed to be able to, uh, to, to stop the transfer of the rainy day fund uh, to, to, because it's unnecessary at this point in time. And to be quite honest with you, uh, that we went, uh, I acquiesced and went along with the House of Delegates, uh, I think it was two years ago, when we were working on creating the trigger mechanism on to, to, to taking care of the rainy day fund. And I said, we'll be end up back here stopping this because we'll have so much money in the rainy day fund that it will help hinder our ability to be able to run the rest of the state. And that's exactly what's coming in place. And the rainy day fund is very important. It helps with our bond ratings and stuff like that when you want to borrow money uh, for roads and stuff like that. And so... With our fiscal management has been nothing short of excellent on how we've been going about doing things. And I talked about it on your show, but uh, when I was with Shelley, we're going to draw down $1.2 billion to get fiber on the pole wherever there's an electrical pole in the state of West Virginia. That is going to be amazing, but it's going to take $300 million of private money, and I say private, uh, to matching dollars is a better way of putting it. And I've got uh, the industry, the providers of the broadband, in agreement, they'll put at least 150 in. If they put 150 in, then we'll do another 150 of for not forgivable loans, excuse me, loan guarantees. But if they come up with two hundred, two hundred and fifty million dollars, then we can look at it as a granting mechanism. What we don't want to do is pay for the infrastructure and then turn it over to providers, even though that's exactly what we do with water and sewer. Uh, but we're, we're We've got a somewhat of an agreement to be able to work that out. We're the second state in the nation. Louisiana was the first, and we were the second. And that was something I was very, very instrumental in getting across the finish line. Do you have anybody, Craig, that you are encouraging to look to run for the next Senate presidency? 
No, I, what I want to do is because I'll be the Senate president until January, uh, and I want to be able to help them. I want to be able to help them be successful, uh, and they want me to. They know I have an institutional knowledge. If I would have won my election, uh, it was my goal to uh, be Senate president for the next two years and to get them to t- be talking about who they would be interested in so I could bring somebody in and be t- uh, showing them what and learning some of the tricks of on being able to manage. And again, I learned in the minority in the House of Delegates. I learned in the minority in the Senate. I learned, learned from Bill Cole, Mitch Carmichael, I've paid close attention to what's going on. Uh, and so I would have not been the Senate president after those two years. I, I didn't publicize that out there, but I can now. I'm, I'm set free. Uh, but some of my members knew that that was going to be my goal. It's not about the title. It's about the work that we do for the people of West Virginia. That is what's important, and you want to have a transition. And you know where I got that idea of being able to do it? It's Rotary. Rotary has a chair-elect and the post-chair, and all three of them work together. It's the same dynamic that you want to be able to have. I I see that work so well for Rotary, and it's like, why are we not doing something like that for the state of West Virginia? So you have the benefit of the knowledge rather than throwing somebody into the 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 office and never having any experience at all or having little experience so you got on the job learning just like when you're first elected to the legislature it takes you quite some time just to learn where the bathroom is and how the process works and then but it it's one of those things. I'm willing to help out however because I still have one thing that will never go away. That's the love for the people in the state of West Virginia, and they deserve better. And most of my lifetime, they have been made fun of, ranked 49th and 50th in every good category, first and second in every bad except for crime. And that is changing. We are on a trajectory, if we've got the wisdom to stay on it, to be in one of the absolute best states there is in the union. Craig, thanks so much for your time this morning. Very much appreciate it.